Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Henry Foreman down here in Fort Jarvis, New York. Fort Jarvis? That's right. Lucky man. I beg your pardon? Well, the Delaware River on one side and the Never Sink on the other, and that Never Sink just happens to be one of my favorite trout streams. Oh, I see. Many's the time I've wet a line in that piece of water. Uh, Foreman, did you say? Yes, I'm the local representative for Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company. What can I do for you, Mr. Foreman? Uh, not for me, Mr. Dollar, but for one of my clients. I, I should say the husband of one of our clients, one of our rather important clients. Yes? Uh, his name is Teckler, Rudolph Teckler, and he lives a few miles north here, the other side of Monticello. I see. Lovely place, two or three hundred acres of beautiful woodland, a private lake, and so on. Mm, sounds very nice. Uh, usually, though, at this time of year, they're back in New York at their big apartment, one of those luxurious duplex affairs on East River. Also sounds like they're really loaded. Loaded? Oh, ah, yes. Oh, you mean... <laughs> yes, Mr. Dollar, they're, they're quite wealthy. Well, now, uh, what's his problem? I haven't the least idea. Hmm? All I know is that he called me a few minutes ago, and he asked, well, as a matter of fact, he insisted... Did you come and see him? If that is, you have some free time, and by that he meant anything from a few days to a few weeks. Funny. Must have something to do with his insurance. I, I don't know, sir. Well, look, Mr. Foreman... He, he did make it very plain that it's most important, important to you, that is, uh, to you personally. To me? Uh, yes, he implied that if there were any question about your expenses so on, why, he'd be more than glad to pay your expense account himself. Ah. Yes. Oh, in other words, Mr. Dollar... In other words, uh... Maybe I can be a little free with the old expense account for a change. Well, now, that isn't quite what I was thinking. Well, let's pretend it was, though. Uh, well, now, look Now, here. just relax, Mr. Foreman. I'll grab a plane or a train or something and be down there to see you. Uh, now, Mr. I'll Dollar. see you. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company office in Port Jarvis, New York. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Monticello Mystery Matter. Expense account item one, $9.10 plane trip to New York. Item two, 50 bucks deposit on a rental car. I picked up Route 46, then 23, and some 70-odd miles later, pulled into Port Jarvis at the point where Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York all come together. It's a nice little city there on the Delaware. Quite a railroad center and even better known for its glass companies. Henry Foreman's office was on Main Street, and after the usual how-to-do's, I again asked the question. Believe me, Mr. Dollar, I don't know anything more about it than I told you on the phone. But in view of this company's policy of service to its clients, service of any kind, well, I felt we must succeed to his quest uh, that you be brought down here. I see. And after all, when you consider the size of Mrs. Teckler's life policy alone, the annual premiums we collect on it, and uh, remember this too, sir. She was a client of the company's long before she married Teckler. She's the widow of the late Horace Rathbun Mellinger. Uh, well, you know. The big steel and oil fortune. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's no wonder, then, that Teckler's are loaded. Uh, precisely. Well, just give me their address, and I'll see what I can do about inaugurating a share of the wealth program. I drove north on 42 for some 25 miles to Monticello. Especially at this time of the year, this foot of the Catskills country is mighty beautiful. Then west for a few miles to the little town of Bethel, then north on a narrow, twisting little road to a spot somewhere between Canosa Lake and Swan Lake. There was a tall steel wire fence about the place, but the heavy gate was unlocked, so I went on through. And there it was. About as isolated and beautiful a place as I've ever seen. It might as well have been a hundred miles away from the dozens of resorts and vacation spots that dot that area. The main building, the lodge, I guess you'd call it, was a kind of a large, two-story log cabin affair with a high peaked roof that would shed the winter snow. It was surrounded on three sides by tremendous trees, and they framed the lodge perfectly. It was a picture spot of the sort you, you've seen in a movie. And on the fourth side, out in front of the lodge and not more than a hundred yards away... 
one look at that blue, placid lake, and there must have been at least 20 acres of it, made me wish that I'd brought along every bit of fishing tackle I'd ever owned. As I stood there by the side of my car, taking it all in, a pair of lunker smallmouth bass jumped clear of the water, scattering it like the proverbial pearls in the sunshine. So you like it, huh? Like it? Oh, brother, what a fisherman's heaven this is. Yes, it really is. And you must be Johnny Dollar, and I'm Rudy Tackler. And how are you? Spellbound, if you want the truth. <laughs> I didn't think a place like this ever really existed. Look at that. Did you see him? I saw him. Son of a gun, Mr. Tecker. That bass just broke water out there. Must be over three pounds. You're a fisherman, too? Mm -hmm. I certainly am. <laughs> what are we doing just standing here? I thought you might just possibly feel that way about it. Why, sure. Why aren't we out there and... Oh, it is uh, slightly out of season, isn't it? Well, what's the difference? Private lake on private property. If the game warden comes around, I just shoo him away. I also forgot that I'm supposed to be up here on business. Oh? Are you? Well, aren't I? Not so far as I know. <laughs> You're kidding. Not a bit. Well, you sent for me, didn't you? Yes, that's right. My wife and I sent for you, but not on business. I don't get it. Not on business? Not a bit of it. Well, why, then? <laughs> Johnny, suppose you've gone into the house. Here. I'll help you with your bag. Well, now, wait, Mr. Teckler. Oh, now, come, come, Mr. Teckler. A fine fishing pal you're going to make to you. It's Rudy, okay? <laughs> okay, Rudy, fine. Now, uh... What was that crack about a fishing pal? Oh, come along into the house and meet Nancy, my wife. Come on. All right. But if you're implying that you sent for me just to fish this beautiful lake of yours... Well, why not? Well, I'm afraid it's a little hard to believe. I don't see why. Well, let's just say I've been around, Mr. Uh, uh, Rudy. <laughs> well, then maybe if Nancy tells you the same thing. Well, much as I'd like to, I still won't believe it. Come along and we'll see. <laughs> Maybe because of long years in this job of mine, I'm overly suspicious. But it all seemed just a little too good to be true. Now, I ask you, what would you think if a couple of complete strangers casually handed you the sort of chance and situation you've only dared dream about all your life? Yes. And when I met Mrs. Teckler there in the lodge, that silly little bell in the back of my head that saved my job and even my life on occasion, that warning, if you like, suddenly began to ring out loud and clear. Have you ever stopped to realize how lucky we are? When people behind the Iron Curtain turn on their radios, they hear only what their leaders want them to hear. In this country, you can flick a switch day or night and get a true, complete report of what's happening everywhere. You get the news first fastest, most accurately, and most completely when your dial is set to this CBS radio network station. Because the network is serviced by the far-flung fact-gathering facilities of expanded CBS News. Experienced CBS newsmen stationed in strategic places of the world over are on top of a story the moment it breaks. For news about local, state, national, and international affairs, even the news from out of this world count on the frequent broadcasts of expanded CBS News. Hear CBS News every hour on the hour, every weekday. Wherever you are, keep in touch with the world through world-spanning CBS News. In this land where the news is free and reliable, let CBS News satisfy your need to know. Mrs. Rudolph Teckler, beneficiary of the vast Horace Rathbone Mellinger fortune, was short, sweet, pert, and pretty. About five feet two or three with a trim, almost wiry figure. She had a pale, flawless complexion, sparkling dark blue eyes that contrasted with her light colored hair. And she gave the impression of being very active, very alert, in spite of the fact that she must have been almost 60 years of age. Then you do like our little country place, Mr. Dollar. Like it? I love it, Mrs. Settler. Oh, I knew you would. We do, too, don't we, darling? Right, you know the answer to that as well as I do, Nan. And, Johnny, you must call me Nancy, even if only to flatter me and make me feel young again. Well, you are young, Nancy. <laughs> well, thank you. In spite of the fact I had to ask for it. Not at all. <laughs> you see, Johnny, this was Horace's. He was my first husband. Horace's hunting lodge. We used to come up here during the deer season, and we'd have all sorts of people around shooting off guns and playing poker all night and eating their heads off and making a general nuisance of themselves. But Horace liked it, so I put up with it. 
spite of all the work it meant for me. It certainly did, and it still does. And I think we ought to bring a couple of the servants up here. Oh, now, darling. Well, you work much too hard all the time we're here. Yes, but I like getting away from the servants for a change and all their problems. Well, I know, Nan, And but... it's no hardship for me. Does me good, keeps me healthy. Well, just the same, Nancy. Next year, when we come up here... Next year? Well, we'll see. <laughs> but if I'm feeling as well as I do now... Well, anyway, Johnny. Yes? After Horace died, well, Rudy's never liked hunting, have you, dear? Well, Johnny, I'm no sissy, but I just don't like killing, that's all. I mean, poor, dumb animals. Fishing, though? Ah, that's something else again. I'm with you. So, after Rudy and I got married, that was in 58, well, that's when he put in the lake. Stocked it with nice big bass and some pickerel and sunfish and bluegills and things. Oh, you have me fairly drooling, you know that. (laughs) Well, I'm glad. (laughs) Because that's the reason I thought of having you up here. And when I suggested it to Rudy... uh... Ah, now, honey. Well, at first he thought I was silly. But then when he had a chance to think it over, he was just as enthusiastic about having you here as I was. Just to go fishing? Well, Johnny, I'll make a true confession. I'm an old fan of yours. Oh? I never miss those weekly radio reports you make on the cases you solve. (laughs) Well, maybe I'm lucky you don't know about the ones I don't solve. I think the work you do is wonderful. And I've wanted to meet you for years. Well, I thank you, ma'am. Well, but never having any insurance problems, well, I just couldn't think of a logical excuse. And I knew you'd only be bored to death at any of the constant round of big, dull parties we have to give all winter long down in New York. And believe me, Johnny, they are dull. (laughs) (laughs) But they're expected in this circle that we're obliged to travel in. You know, Johnny, old friends of Horace's, so what can we do? Anyway... One Sunday night, listening to one of your radio reports, I suddenly realized you constantly talk about fishing. So here you are, and please stay as long as you like. Uh, Nancy, I love you dearly. Good. And by way of celebration, darling, why don't you pour us all a drink? Good idea. And then while I'm fixing dinner, there'll still be about an hour of daylight. Why don't you two go out on the lake? A very good idea. And Johnny Dollar, if you don't bring back at least a couple of five-pounders... I promise, Nancy. Honest engine. Short, sweet, pert, and pretty, I said. I should have added one more adjective. Smart. And that's why, in spite of her excuse for having me around, I wondered what her real reason was. But they didn't give me much time for wondering or anything else. Within half an hour, Rudy and I were out on the lake. That beautiful hunk of water so loaded with fighting bass that who could miss coming in with a limit? But we did. For no sooner had we got started across toward the far side, where there was plenty of the reeds and lily pads the big ones like to hide under. Ah, uh, Johnny, it looks to me... Uh... Ah, yeah, I see the place, Rudy, and if there aren't some lunkers over there, I'll eat my shirt. No, 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 what I was thinking of... I still of... think we could have caught a sack full right off the dock. Uh, but not the big ones, no. What I was thinking of is that mass of black clouds moving in on us there. Ah, uh, you're right. Look, there's... A little chop building up in the water, too. Yes, I'm afraid we're in for a sudden blow and a lot of rain. You know what that does to the fishing? Oh, darn it, especially in a shallow lake like this one. Well, I tell you, it's not as shallow as it looks. Oh? This was a kind of canyon up here in these mountains before we dammed it up, and some of the spots are nearly 20 feet deep. Mm. Maybe we'd better figure... Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah, here it comes. Boy, don't you mean here it is. Uh Wow. Regular cloudburst. Mm -hmm. Certainly can't fish in this. Can't even see where we are. I'm afraid you're right, Rudy. Well, don't you worry. We'll have plenty of time in the days ahead for all the fishing you can take. Well, that may be a bigger order than you think. Of course, if this blows over, we can come out tonight again. Sometimes the night fishing is great. I'll try anything. But as long as it keeps up like this... Oh, well, I'm sorry. So we'll go on back to the dock, if I can find it. Then back to the house, build a big fire. We can sit in front of it and drown our sorrows, huh? You mean if we don't get ourselves drowned first? Right. After cocktails, and plenty of them, during the delicious dinner Nancy had cooked for us, although we talked about nothing but fishing, I began to wonder again. Because I suddenly became aware of something between these two that hadn't shown before, but I couldn't quite put my finger on a sort of tension that they both very obviously tried to hide. This very young man and the older, wealthy woman he'd married... Later in the living room, as we sat in front of a roaring fire and Rudy became a bit too generous with the highballs, especially his own, 
I wondered some more, because several times when he glanced over at her while she was talking to me, there was a very strange look in his eyes. Fear? Could it have been fear? But of what? I decided I'd better get him alone and talk to him, but by the time Nancy went up to her room to bed, the drinks had had their effect on him, and he didn't make very much sense. Uh, just one more little one, huh, Johnny? I mean, for a sort of nightcap. No, huh? thanks, Rudy. <laughs> I've had enough. Uh, you always drink this much? Oh, well, I remember what I said this afternoon, drown your sorrows, I said, drown your sorrows. Yeah, hey, Johnny, it's a very good idea. Okay, bottoms up. Oh. Rudy, uh, are you worried about something? Why, me? With lots of money, I never have to do a lick of work. Nice little wife, a couple of nice places to live. Not me, Johnny. Not a thing in the world. Not as long as I can drown my sorrows. Hey, let's have just one more. Now, look, if the weather stays clear the way it is right now and we're going to do any fishing tomorrow morning, maybe we better hit the sack, huh? Yeah, sure, okay. You find your way up to your room all right? I think I can. The point is, can you? Me? Oh, sure. Right next to Nancy's room. You're on the other side. Oh. Hmm. Well, shall we? I think we'd better. I helped him up to his room, put him to bed, and he promptly went out like a light. What he'd said about the clean, cool mountain air was certainly true. I slept like a log. Almost as though I'd been drugged, and not because of the after-dinner drinks. I'd watched that pretty carefully. Then shortly after sunup came the rude awakening. Yeah, yes, Johnny. Johnny! Yes. What's the matter, Rudy? What is it? It's Nancy. Something's happened to her. Come on, quickly. Quickly! Where can you find such entertainers as Buster Davenport and his talking minor bird? Where can you find Lucille and her magic ocarina? Or little Billy and his 14-piece jug band? Well, frankly, we don't know where you can find them. But what sure thing, here on the CBS Radio Network, you find the top names in show business. Arthur Godfrey, Art Linkletter, Gary Moore, Bing Crosby, and Rosemary Clooney. And you find them here every weekday morning. Guaranteed entertainment. Monday through Friday, right here at the Star's Address. What is it, Rudy? What's happened? She's gone. Nancy's gone. Something's happened to her. Look. Look at this. Her bed's been slept in, but she isn't here. All right. Now, just take it easy. <sighs> Maybe she just got up early to fix breakfast for us before we go out on the lake. No, no, Johnny. She isn't anywhere. I mean, not anywhere in the house. I've looked all over. Out for an early walk, maybe. What? Without getting dressed? How do you know that? Look, the only things that are missing are the nightgown she wore and her robe and a pair of slippers. Now, wait a minute. You mean you've checked every other article of clothing she owns? Well, no, 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 of course not. But those things are missing. Did you look around the ground? Oh, yes, all over. Uh, except in the woods, of course. Which just happens to cover most of this place of yours. Johnny, the point is she's gone without letting me know. I say something's happened to her. How many cars do you keep here? Well, uh, just the one, but it's still in the garage. Besides, Nancy doesn't drive. Mm. Did you look for any footprints when you were outside? Yes. In the mud from that rain we had? Yeah, yes, Johnny, there were none. How about tracks down at the gate? The road is paved down to the gate, even out to the highway. Is there any way off the property except through that gate? No, no, there's, there, there's no other way out. What could have happened to her? Just calm down, Rudy. Let me get some clothes on and we'll look around. I, I, oh, I hope she's all right. Any reason why she shouldn't be? Well, no, of course not, and yet... Yes? Well... Oh, there was something. Uh, last night, Johnny, there in, in, in front of the fireplace. Yeah? Well, didn't you get the feeling, too, that she was worried about something? Now that you mention it, yes. But what? I wish I knew. Then maybe I'd, I'd know what's happened to her. All right, you go downstairs and make some coffee while I get into my clothes. Then we'll have a look around. <laughs> I still didn't understand all his alarm until we had to look around that place. And I mean all of it. There was no sign of her anywhere, no clue as to why or where she'd gone. And to leave by that front gate and only a nightgown and a, and a robe, 
Uh, Rudy must have been wrong about that. But even if she did change, why aren't those things still here? And why did she leave? And without letting me know, Johnny, it isn't like her. Rudy, any problems between you two? Oh, good heavens, no. Nothing serious. In spite of all her money? And let's face it, your comparative youth... Oh, now wait. Now wait a minute. Now, I resent that, Johnny. I mean, whatever implication you're trying to make. What about your drinking? What, do you say that just because I happened to have a few too many last night? Oh, no. Now, that's ridiculous. And she would have told me if she'd really objected to it. Speaking of which, I think I could use one. Yes. Yes, so can I. All right, I'll get a couple. No, 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 I'll get them. The stuff is still on the bar from last night. I'll get them, Rudy. You just sit tight and keep an eye out this front window in case. Well, but I... (laughs) All right. Uh, bourbon, you know? Yes, I know. It had really hit me. Two things. Several things. Like the complete lack of a hangover, though I'd had to help him up to bed only a few hours before. Nancy and I had been drinking scotch. He'd taken all of his from a bottle of bourbon, so I checked that bottle. Bourbon? Nothing but weak tea. So he'd been putting on an act last night. Why? And why the insistence on keeping my glass filled? More things. That crack about drowning his sorrow, for instance. Was Nancy his sorrow? Because she'd got wise to the fact that he'd married her only for money? And was she the one who was really afraid? Is that why she'd sent for me? Of course, he hadn't wanted me around at first until he realized what a wonderful cover-up I'd be for him. But then where was the body? There was one place. A very obvious place. Maybe so obvious I wasn't expected to think of it. It's the obvious we most often overlook. Or was all this just wild speculation on my part? I had to find out. You... you say a hunch, Johnny? Yes, Rudy, and by some miracle, they usually pay off for me. Well... What kind of a hunch? There's one place on this property we didn't think of. Where? You just sit tight and finish your drink while I have a look. Well, all all right, Johnny. You wait here. I'll be back in a few minutes. The little dam there at one end of the lake was a simple affair. Two concrete abutments with a wall of 12-inch planks between them, one on top of the other. To raise the water level, you added a plank and to lower it, of course. It was a bit of a struggle to pry away the top one, but I managed it. And the water started pouring out into a sort of canyon below. And then, as I fully expected... Johnny! Johnny, what are you doing? Are you out of your mind? Yes, I know, Rudy. I hate to spoil the... The whole lake will go down. You want to give me a hand and help me pull another one of these planks? What? Until we get the water low enough to see where you left her body after you killed her last night? Well, Rudy? Uh, Johnny, look, uh... It won't be necessary. You see, I'll show you the spot. But listen, listen to me. I'm listening. Not only the insurance, but all of her estate, it'll mine. And without her to dole it out to me like she would to a child. And there's plenty, you see? There's plenty for both of us. Rudy. We'll both be rich, Johnny. You understand? You see what I mean? It'll be so easy. Rudy, I hate to sound corny. Yes? But why don't you try telling that to a judge? Any comments? Why bother? I hate this kind of case. But it does happen. Expense account total, including mileage on the rental car and the trip back to Hartford, seventy-one seventy. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the Everglades of Florida. And believe me, there are spots in there that can be pretty dangerous. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were William Redfield as Rudy, Adele Ronson as Nancy, and Randall Osborne as Henry Foreman. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking.